Hey, what's up guys, it's Matt with Movement System. In this video, we're gonna talk about the three main differences in hypertrophy training for bodybuilders versus hypertrophy training for athletes. Bodybuilders are often working towards the outcomes of aesthetics and muscle symmetry and overall building the most amount of muscle mass possible with their training. They aren't going to let anything get in the way of their pursuit to a trophy, not to be mistaken with atrophy. But athletes are primarily using hypertrophy training for the specific purpose of accommodating to a higher volume of training or getting used to a big training load so that way they can later turn that training load into more specific sport training with things like speed and power and strength. So athletes are more using hypertrophy as a base, building some muscle mass, but also focusing on being able to translate those into more neuromuscular adaptations and more speed and strength and power. So we're gonna break down the three main differences that you need to consider when writing a program for a bodybuilder versus an athlete. One, exercise selection. Two, proximity to failure. And three, training split slash conditioning. We're gonna talk about the program design variables for these three things and what you might do to tweak your program to optimize for a bodybuilder versus optimizing for an athlete. Let's go ahead and dive into it. So to start off with exercise selection, Bodybuilders are often choosing very stable movements that they can program for higher sets and reps and build a lot of fatigue in one muscle group. For training legs, for example, bodybuilders may prioritize things like hack squats, leg press, or barbell back squats and focus on building size with these big stable compound bilateral movements. So a bodybuilder may do eight sets of a big compound stable movement. By contrast, an athlete in a hypertrophy phase may do four sets of a big compound leg movement like a leg press, a hack squat, or a back squat, similar exercises, but they may also prioritize a few different movements outside of the sagittal plane. They may work on things like Cossack squats or lateral movements, or during their hypertrophy phase, they may even shift some of their volume to something like a power clean to where they're developing some power alongside their hypertrophy work. The principle here is that athletes need to move outside of the sagittal plane and consider more than just stable bilateral exercises. When we think of developing the hamstrings, a bodybuilder may choose to optimize hamstring development with things like RDLs and hamstring curls. This type of exercise selection is very stable and will allow them to develop constant tension, work into a stretch, and build hypertrophy with those two exercises. An athlete thinking about hamstring development may do some of that, but they may prioritize more sets of things like clean pulls that are a bit more explosive and getting to full triple extension, as well as exercises like Nordic hamstring curls, which though they can develop some hypertrophy, that's more for developing a peak force output and you're probably not gonna do as much volume of Nordic hamstring curls as you could of just regular hamstring curls and RDLs. So you're not gonna get quite as much hypertrophy, but you're gonna develop specific peak force output, which could actually be protective of hamstring injuries for athletes, not as much of a concern in a bodybuilding program. I do wanna be clear that there is a lot of overlap between what bodybuilders and what athletes are gonna do, but it's important to also understand these differences. I personally mentored about 50 new strength and conditioning coaches through my previous strength and conditioning program design mentorship and individually looked at the programs they designed and the way that bodybuilders kind of write the rules of the gym, a lot of new coaches end up writing body part splits and doing a bunch of sets of accessory movements like bicep curl variations and tricep extension variations, whereas athletes probably only need a little bit of accessory work and more focus on the compound movements and developing good motor patterns. By doing four days a week, for example, of full body training for an athlete, they can focus on neuromuscular development of new motor patterns. For example, really building good triple extension mechanics with different exercises, that's gonna be a bigger priority for athletes than just doing a bunch of isolation work for their arms or even their legs. And whenever it comes to things like core training, a lot of bodybuilders will just do abdominal training with like crunches and sit-ups and something that's going to aesthetically improve the abdominal musculature. Whereas it would be beneficial for athletes to focus on more functional core training with things like carries and marches and different conditioning work. Those exercises aren't optimal for muscle development, so that may actually be abnormal in a bodybuilder's ab training routine, but functional core training can actually be really beneficial for developing different athletic motor patterns and improving athletic performance. All right, number two is proximity to failure. And bodybuilders will often train much closer to failure and carry more fatigue between sessions. For example, a bodybuilder may hit the quads 
two times a week and really put a lot of volume into quad training and kind of wreck their quads to where they can't use them effectively for the next two days. That might be a good strategy and especially if you're an enhanced bodybuilder, you can just crush each muscle group. But for an athlete, there's a lot of reasons why that might not be optimal. Athletes are often doing conditioning and sport training at the same time as their hypertrophy blocks of training. So you need to keep them fresh enough that they can be effective on the field with their other training. Spreading out their volume throughout the week instead of doing a body part split and crushing one muscle group at a time is probably a better strategy for athletes. And in terms of motor learning, it's really hard to develop a new motor pattern if you're trying to improve, for example, your jump mechanics to improve your vertical jump. Training it once or twice a week is gonna be very difficult to see improvements, whereas if you can repeat that motor pattern and variations of it multiple times throughout the week, that gives your brain and muscle connection a lot more practice with that movement and gives you a better likelihood of actually improving the mechanics of it. You may hear the bodybuilder who only takes advice from people who are on steroids and do true bodybuilding So you have to train close to failure, bro, because if you're not training close to failure, you might as well just hand in your two-week notice, you little but for training natural athletes, fatigue management is a real skill and good strength and conditioning coaches know when to push their athletes in what phases of training and in what times throughout a program to actually push them into more fatigue and when to back off. So this isn't to say that athletes can never train to failure. There's definitely a time and a place for it, especially towards the end of a block of training on accessory movements that aren't gonna build as much fatigue and things like that, but it's probably not gonna be as close to failure and as fatiguing as a bodybuilder's workout. And that leads us into point number three, which is training split and conditioning. Bodybuilders who get really lean often have very, very poor conditioning, meaning that they couldn't go out on a field and do repeated sprints and do a high level of activity for sport, even though they look very lean. These things can go hand in hand, so often athletes do get lean and condition at the same time, but it's not always directly correlated. To optimize body composition, they may be in the gym seven hours a week lifting weights and just do some cardio or conditioning or maybe just control nutrition in order to get lean, but they may not be doing a lot of energy system development to actually improve their conditioning, meaning they can't actually sprint very hard or recover between efforts of sport performance and do things like plyometrics. So an athlete who has the same seven hours to train may only lift for four of those seven hours and may spend three of that seven hours on conditioning work specifically. That conditioning work may be bike sprints, sled pushes, interval runs, or any other form of conditioning that's not gonna be optimal for hypertrophy, but will give them good energy system development. There are probably a lot of you out there also thinking about the hybrid training approach and doing some bodybuilding work, some athletic training work. And if you're doing power building or some sort of concurrent hybrid training approach, let me know about your goals and your training approach in the comments because there is a lot of really interesting overlap there where you can get some good bodybuilding adaptations and also some athletic adaptations. And if you're looking to learn more about how to structure training with an actual program, go ahead and download my five-step guide to writing a strength and conditioning program in the description below. I actually give you my training template in that guide so you can take it and actually go ahead and write a formal strength and conditioning program out for yourself or for your athletes. And then if you wanna learn more and see an exact detailed breakdown of how I do it, you can sign up for my course, Program Design 101. Thanks so much for watching guys. Subscribe so you don't miss any future videos and I will catch you in the next one.